What's up? Test one, two, three. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, guten Tag, guten Morgen. Um, hello. My name is Sean Larkin. Uh, did you get a little bit of wet in the snow today? Maybe? Some? Oh, uh, kind of. Okay. So yes, my name is Sean Larkin, and the name of this talk is, as it was mentioned, everything is a plugin. Mastering Webpack from the inside out, right? So how many of you have heard of this tool called Webpack? How many here use it today and powers your production websites? All right, keep, keep your hands held. <laughs> please, please. Uh, how many here know how it works? Look around, look around. Well, I hope today is the last time you don't get to raise your hand for that. Um, so this is correct, I'm a program manager at Microsoft. I work on Microsoft Edge. Um, the team that I work for is called Ecosystem and so our single purpose is to uh, make sure that our engagements uh, with frameworks, build tools, uh, anything related to JavaScript and the web are heard as we design and create new features. Um, but you may know me as one of the maintainers of the Webpack open source project. Um, conveniently, we also have two other maintainers here, the original creator of Webpack, Tobias, raise your hand. Yes, so there's Tobias. And also, Johannes Ewald, raise your hand. Yes, so he's back there as well. So come say hi to us. <clears throat> um, and I'm also a huge evangelist for open source and a representative on, uh, for the Node.js Foundation and the modules group and on the WebAssembly community group. Um, so a little bit about myself is that I'm a, uh, uh, I'm a former tech support rep gone rogue. I got tired of not being able to solve people's problems. I actually went to school for church music, so I was going to be a Kapellmeister. And seriously, for the university, and, um, but I, I, I started learning how to program and you know, I eventually found JavaScript and fell in love. Um, I also love sustainable open source and building ecosystems just like Webpack and for other projects as well. And you can find me, so like if you uh, have a Twitter, if you have LinkedIn, whatever, any of those things, I'm at the Lark Inn, so you can find me there. Um, but none of this today would be powered uh, without like our main sponsors like Trivago. Uh, who here knows what Trivago is? It's a German company based in Dusseldorf. The team is here, I think, also. Um, so uh, one of the things I want to talk about is without any of the work, uh, none of this would be possible without um, our major contributors like Trivago and also um, any of these companies here if you work for them, you know, you could raise your hand or stand up, but we would not be here without these open source contributions who help sponsor and fund our project. So before I, you know, I go on, I, let's give them a hand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Seriously, you, we might not have Webpack 3, 4, or even 5 uh, coming down the road. So everything is a plugin. Mastering Webpack from the inside out. So, uh, these are the, the things that I want to do today is that first we're going to maybe walk through a little bit of the Webpack source code. Don't worry. It's, it's not that intimidating once we uh, break it apart. Um, we're going to learn what a Webpack plugin is and its anatomy and then have ultimate power. <laughs> these are my goals for you. Um, and you know, selfishly, us as a team, like we want your help. We want your contributions. And even, I mean, even before we continue, uh, you know, we have to talk about Webpack as a architecture and a system. Um, so we have this library called Tappable. Webpack, uh, Tappable is our plugin system that is built into the Webpack open source project and it used to be about a 200 line plugin library. It's now increased in size a little bit, but it represents the backbone of the entire system. Without it, Webpack would be nothing. Um, it has what we call a series of hooks or events. Who's used event emitter before in Node.js? Many. Okay, good. Well, you can think of this as similar. Um, so we have these hooks that live on, piece, uh, on instances or important classes in Webpack. And each of these define different parts of the life cycle that you know, happens within Webpack. 
Um, and so if we look at this example here, we have, um, we have a class. It's the easiest way to, to find a Webpack plugin. Um, the only rule is that you have an apply method, and uh, you're, you're going to plug into each of these hooks. So we provide you the top-level instance called the compiler. And you can plug into these events and add additional functionality or features. Here's one with some, some JS doc annotations, but just another example here. We're hooking into the, the make event, and now you have access to a compilation. Um, and, and here's another one, you know, you can plug into multiple events. It's not just one. Um, and uh, the beautiful part here is that all of Webpack uses this entire system. So, I know it might be hard to see on the screen, but if you look in the Webpack source code, 80% of it is plugins. So you're probably familiar, if you've used Webpack, you've seen a plugin before in your configuration. Webpack uses this entire system. So Webpack is a completely event-driven uh, uh, plugin-based compiler. And you know, you go on here, everything is plugins in Webpack. Even to collect the entry point and create and start kicking off the dependency graph. And I kind of go through a couple examples here. So why, why do we care about plugins then? Because if you understand how to create and a plugin itself, then you know how the hell Webpack works. Um, so we're going to talk about what we call tappable instances. And what does it mean when I say that? So a tappable instance is just something that extends or uses these events or hooks. Uh, AKA something you can plug into. And uh, in our system, we not only have just a single thing you plug into, you, uh, this plugin system allows you to hook into events that return other things that you can plug into. So the compiler returns a compilation and you plug into a deeper part of the uh, life cycle of Webpack. So what I'm going to do today is talk about each of these tappable instances. And then we're going to kind of string together a story so that you see why these are all important. So the compiler, the compi uh, who has ever used a compiler before outside of Webpack or knows what it is, took computer science. So you're familiar with what a compiler does. Um, and these are just names that we've given uh, these, these instances. So the compiler instance itself is the top level event. Um, uh, it has everything to do with the starting and stopping of Webpack, any sort of top level APIs that you're going to use. I like to consider it central dispatch or Hauptbahnhof, you can say. Uh, it is the main station in which things operate. And you can use a compiler instance straight from the Node API. And this is how people who use the Node API command line tools that leverage Webpack, uh, they're using it. You have access directly to that compiler instance. The second is called the compilation and maybe easily described as the dependency graph. So the dependency graph is basically the, the meat and potatoes of, of Webpack. It, is, um, it, it contains this DEP dependency graph traversal algorithm, lots of big names. Um, what you need to know is it's how Webpack understands which sources you're actually using in your code base. Um, and it's created by the compiler. You can call it the brain. Um, and then we have what's called the resolver. Who knows what a resolver is? Who, who uses Node.js and you know, doesn't have to p use a fully qualified path, right? So that's what the Node resolver does. It allows you to type a partial path and returns implicitly a full absolute path so that it actually knows that file exists. So a good example is if we use this, uh, this comic that I've drawn here is that we'll take a partially resolved file we'll pass it to the resolver and say, hey, go make sure it exists, right? And if it does, we want this and this information. And so you can see here, it goes and finds it, and it returns a bunch of useful things that's necessary for us to collect the source. And you can see here that the resolver itself, as I said, is pluggable, and so therefore, 
we already have a bunch of plugins created behind the scenes in a separate library that allow you to have all the customization you want in Webpack. And then next we have what's called the module factory. Who's ever written Java before? Who's ever had to use a factory like a something something factory factory? Yes, you know, you get it. So um, you can blame Tobias for this name, but um, the module factory is responsible for creating an object. Um, and in this case, it's the module itself, the representation. And so it takes a successfully resolved request with the source information that we need and it collects that source. It reads the file and then it stores it in this, this object in memory. And we're going to use it later. So if we depicted this, it might look like this information that we need about a file. We send it through the module factory and out comes this beautiful module, right? Wow, so pretty. <laughs> and then the parser. Who's ever written a parser? Cool. You might, oh, wow, okay. Who knows how a parser works or knows what an AST is? Very cool. Excellent. So a parser is, uh, well, what does it do? It parses. So it takes a string um, and it converts it into a tree, a tree form that makes it easy for um, any sort of programmer or compiler to walk the source text of the file that's been written. And it turns it into this, this object called an AST or a tree um, and, and it makes it easy to walk. And so in this case, we do the exact same thing. We parse the file and we create an AST, but we do something special. We walk through this, this AST and we look for specific statements, imports, requires, dynamic imports. And we mark, we create, we trigger an event and we say, hey, add a dependency to this module object. We create what's called dependencies. So you can say we pass the module through our parser glasses <laughs> and we look for those requires and imports. And it, we attach these dependency instances to the module itself. Now you can see I've shaded these with individual colors because there are many different types, right? We have common JS, we have ES imports, we have the dynamic import statement, and Webpack supports all of them, and so we have to understand which ones were, were used inside that file. And then finally, template. Who uses a template in their web code every day? You do, uh, all hands can be raised. JSX, Angular templates, Vue, uh, templating, what is a template's purpose? It's data binding for a Vue representation, right? Well. In this specific case, we use templates in Webpack because it's data binding for your graph. It's data binding for the dependency graph itself and what it renders is the actual code you see when Webpack runs, so like your bundle. Um, we have all these abstractions, right? So we have a chunk template, we have a module template, we have dependency templates, we have a main template and each of these has a render function that will take the data it's bound to and it will then create the strings, the string representation. Now if you're familiar with the Webpack like output of the code, you notice at the far right this looks almost identical to that. You have your main template, you have each function in the iffy, and so we're just taking and rendering this entire graph into a string. If you wrote it in React, and you used a string renderer, it might look like this, right? You have some sort of compilation, you'd say for each chunk and then for each module inside each chunk, generate, you know, and render. So, but if we take a step back now, I know this looks confusing, don't worry. <laughs> what do, we look at all of our tappable instances now and so we start with the compiler, it says run. Um, we read the configuration object provided by the user or the default values. And then we take and access the entry point, right? But it's not a result, we don't, it's only a partial path, right? So we send it through the module factory to the resolver. We verify it exists. We pull the, uh, the entire source and then we return the module. Then we go and we parse that file. We collect its source and we look for other dependency statements, right? and we attach them to that instance and then we say, well, for each dependency on that module, it's unresolved, right? So repeat the step for each dependency. And you might be like, what, Sean, stop, that's way too fast. So I broke it down. 
So we start with the entry point, right? We collect, let's say, index.js. We have to take this and resolve this into an absolute path, right? We attach this to a module object. And we give it an ID too, so we have to access it later. The ID can change depending on your environment. It's not as important. But we create a module object. We have the source code now. Now we have to parse it. And as we're walking the AST, we found two more dependencies. So we attach them as edges in our graph. And now we repeat this process. We take that unresolved dependency. We now create a module out of it. We collect the source, we resolve it, and repeat. So you repeat those steps until you have no more dependencies. <laughs> but I've just talked about building the graph. I know this, this one is even more fun. But how does, how does this graph actually turn into something that's usable in the browser, right? So I have a little comic strip that I wrote. So it's like, hi, I'm a module. I can't wait to work in the browser. And we're like, well, the compilation says, whoa, there, cool your jets. We need to get you in the shape. So first, jump in this container. We need to keep track of you. We're going to move you around and topologically sort you. Um, and we don't want to lose track of you. It's like, wow, I'm so cozy. I've been shuffled around and sorted topologically. Are we there yet? <laughs> Has all its dependency references on it. We're almost there, but we have a problem. Those required import statements have to go. They don't work in the browser. So the parser gave me special instructions to render those dependencies. We call them dependency templates and factories. And out of the factory, it goes into this string. It says, wow, I'm finally rendered. Here I come, browser land. <laughs> and you just learned how Webpack works entirely under the hood. What? You did. That is entirely how Webpack works under the hood. Now, Tobias might be back there like, you missed a step, but I'm just covering the most important parts. Covering the most important parts. And this was my, like, <laughs> what? What? That's it? Um, it took me by surprise at first. It may take you by surprise at first. Um, but why should I care, Sean? I just want, just let me write some web code. I just want to write some web. It's like, it's okay. Because now that you understand every instance and every piece of the life cycle and how it works, because Webpack is an event-driven plugin architecture, it means you can take and extend any single piece of Webpack to do anything that you want, literally. And so you might be like, wow, Sean, that's interesting. <laughs> Where can I start? So we have lots of opportunities. This originally used to, be a, uh, used to be a workshop for creating plugins. But now I find it to be more interesting to teach people just how it works under the hood, not only so that you can better understand it, appreciate it, but also extend and make it work for your workflow. So I do have a GitHub repository called Everything is a Plugin. You can always take a look at it. And I also have, um, uh, it's a little dated by version, but it helps you learn the concepts of using Webpack itself and not its architecture. So you can go to webpack.academy, and these courses are free. Um, we wanted to be able to have something that's entry level that anybody could access. And obviously, I had to learn this at one point. Uh, when I started out as a maintainer, I only had one commit to the project. I don't even think maybe the commit landed when I joined. So, when I wanted to talk about Webpack, I was terrified uh, or even contribute. And so uh, I went through the entire source code. And with my surface and pen, I annotated every piece of the source code. And so uh, I shared those images uh, you know, on GitHub. So if you ever want to take a look, it's called Artsy Webpack Tour. So this is where I learned how to actually generate these slides and create the content. Um, and hopefully, all of these things that I've talked about today are, are on our docs. <laughs> and if not, you can always do a PR. Uh, so webpack.js.org slash api.plugins, take a look at it. And I mean, we always want your contributions. So triaging, helping with these core plugins and loaders, and finally, just using Webpack 5. So thank you very much. And hopefully, you have some things to think about and extending Webpack for the future. So. Thank you.